Coming up on this week's show, author Jeff Garvin is here to talk about his debut novel, The Symptoms of Being Human, plus we hear from the first of our contributors. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome to episode 30 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from JeffAdamsWrites.com. And I'm Will from WillKanaus.com. Howdy. <laughs> I knew I'd crack you up doing that. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, howdy to you too, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Happy anniversary. <laughs> Happy anniversary to you, cowboy. <laughs> So today as we record this, and I cracked my husband up, hey, um, it was 21 years ago today on May 1st that this one asked me out on a date, and I said yes, mm. and here we are, yeah, here cracking we are. up 21 years later. Yeah, 21 years. Let's do 21 more. Our relationship is legal now. Indeed. Our mm. relationship can drink. Mm. Yeah, this is, um, I consider this the first anniversary, the... Uh, a f- what do I consider it? Um, the r- the real one, the important one, the first one, the definitely the first one. The I mean, the other wedding ones are nice, but I consider May first our you know. Yeah. But when it the, all started, it's the definitive <laughs> anniversary. <Yes. laughs> it's the day our anniversary. Uh, it's the day our relationship you know sprang into the world, sprang. as it were. Sprang, yeah, sprung, sprung. So happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you, too. And, and happy anniversary to the podcast, because this is the six-month anniversary <sighs> oh. of the show. Okay. Yeah. We started the first week of November 2015, and here we are in May 2016. So, 30 episodes, and six months later, here we are. Yay, us. Yes. <laughs> I have to celebrate these little anniversaries when they show up. <laughs> um, and another big anniversary... That's yeah. happening. <laughs> we should we should have had a special s- sounder, you know. Anniversary Palooza. There you go. There's the sounder right there. Okay. What's what's the next anniversary on the list? Uh, Dream Spitter. Dream Spitter is nine years old this month, uh, and to celebrate, they've actually got a sale going on right now. Um, all the authors who began with Dream Spinner in their first three years have their books on sale forty percent off this week. And that includes two of my short stories uh, that are with Dream Spinner. Which short stories would those be? Uh, Bicycle Built for Two mm-hmm. and Hotel Holiday Hookup, which was written as part of last Christmas's uh, advent calendar. They're both there. If you go to dreamspinnerpress.com, you'll see at the top of their homepage this amazing list of authors uh, who were with, who started with them in the first three years. And all those authors have their books on sale for this month, for this week, sorry. That's through May 7th. Awesome. Okay. Yes. So check that out. Yeah, most definitely. You have a little writing milestone. You uh, created some works this week. Uh, well, this this month. Um, I thought oh, I was that having... The mo- oh, that's it, the month. I did not write that much this week. So sorry. My God. Um, <laughs> even, even though these show notes are literally right in front of my face, I'm like, uh, I can't even read them. But I, I felt that April seemed not as productive as I wanted. Uh-huh. And it truly wasn't, but I did manage to get 20,000 words done in the month. Well, that's worth celebrating. Which I'm very happy about. Yes. Uh, most of that was on the Mackinac Island story that I'm working on. Um, and hopefully I'm going to wrap that up. I hope this week it kind of depends on what the day job throws at me. Uh, but certainly I would think within the next, you know, seven to ten days that first draft is wrapped up. Mm-hmm. And then hopefully it's off on its way out the door by the end of May. Cool. Even though I have till the end of June, I'd rather get it out this month. Okay. So I can move on, because the next thing, you know, I, th- I think we start working on something. We uh, should very soon, yes. After I get that done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so finish that. finish that one up. I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm looking forward I'm, to it being read, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. We both have something to look yes, forward exactly. to. exactly. <laughs> well, I want to know if I pulled off this, this story that uses Mackin Island as a setting and uses somewhere in time as, like... A touchstone in the book, and mm-hmm. you know, did I mesh it all together correctly? Mm. We shall see. Yeah. Um, so Tammy Middleton, we talked about this uh, throughout April. Uh, the author's sign off for Autism Awareness Auction ended as of April thirtieth. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we'll be in touch with Tammy to, uh, we want to bring you guys the closing total uh, to let you know how much that raised. But I know uh, from seeing today that the hat trick novels, the three novels plus adding sweet and sexy into that, $110 somebody paid for those. And I, I'm just, I'm honored um, that somebody, you know, likes Simon and Alex and that story enough to pay $110 to get mm -hmm. that set. Yes. Um, something I did, because I was paying attention to the auction as it was getting ready to close towards the end of the week, um, fans of Kendall Alexander want those books. Because uh, I did notice that the the lot that they had, which was for autographed copies of... Um, oh, help me. I've lost the The Nice Guys so, series? Thank you, the Nice Guys yeah. series. Uh, $400. <clears throat> Woohoo! Yeah. Awesome. So that that's awesome. All of it going to a good cause. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was that was very cool. We'll get you that total next week, and hopefully it's a good chunk of change in the thousands. Most definitely. Yeah. Okay. Also this week, apparently you were schmoozing the folks over at the Rote Podcast. Yes, I did. I. Uh, why Why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> I hung out <laughs> um, a little, about almost an hour and a half. Yeah. Um. Had a great time. We talked about, you know, the normal stuff, my books, how I got started in writing. We talked a little bit about this podcast and how we got going with it. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the future stuff, you know, they were interested in what it's like to have another writer in the family. <laughs> I thought it was good. Because uh, it is. You, we, we help each other, you know. Yes, we do. We, we plan and plot and edit together. Mm -hmm. uh, and an interesting question came up as well, uh, kind of around, you know, as a gay man writing gay romance do I feel like I get to represent what it's like being a gay man as fully as I, as fully as I could, given the trope itself? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was it. Was fun to answer that question, trying to decide where I felt the right answer was for me. Okay. And so, when yeah. can we look forward to that episode? That will be out on May sixth. Uh, we'll link up to the Rote website. Oh yeah. Um, okay. In the show notes. And it'll be just on their homepage starting on Friday, May 6th. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Something else to look forward to. Indeed. Yeah. So, we have to give a shout out to our friend uh, David Labounty. I think we've, we've mentioned him at least once back in episode one. Because <clears throat> my origin is tied up with him and how we created the first line. And then mm -hmm. how he went off and created uh, Blue Cubicle Press. Uh, he ended up on the minor league baseball site this week, MILB.com, uh, and we'll link to the specific article uh, in the show notes for episode 30, but he's been doing a, a zine called Bookstores and Baseball, uh, and those of you out there who like bookstores and possibly baseball may get a kick out of these if you go check them out. It chronicles trips that he's taken with his wife, Robin, and his kids, Gabe and Olivia, and they do these itineraries that mix places that have awesome bookstores where there might be literary festivals going on at the time and where there is good baseball to watch, mm -hmm. whether it's major or minor league. Uh, these are fun zines. We've read a couple of them yes, um, periodically. Dave writes for them. His son writes in them. Um, they're pretty awesome. And it was nice to see him get picked up uh, by minor league baseball mm -hmm. for that interview. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing he did this week was he wrote a really nice piece about us on the First Line Facebook page and the podcast. And he created possibly the first podcast drinking game to turn around <laughs> our podcast. Yeah, kind of. You see, there's this <laughs> glass right here that shows up. If you watch on the video feed, Will drinks out of a Wonder Woman glass every episode. <laughs> <coughs> and in fact, you may have noticed already he's taken a drink and he actually did it off camera. <laughs> I was trying to be sly. Trying... Not, not necessarily succeeding. But. So, Will, uh, David suggested that a, a alcoholic beverage could be imbibed each time Will showed Wonder Woman. Or, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, each time that Wonder Woman appeared on camera. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there you go. Think about that if you're into drinking games and while you're watching the podcast. So, thanks to Dave for calling us out on the First Line page. And we encourage the authors in our midst to check out the First Line because it's a great magazine that provides a nice little writing exercise every quarter and kudos to him for being on it milb.com yeah cool so you read a couple of things this week mm -hmm. well not specifically this week in its entirety i have i have two books that i would like to speak of though that works that too I, that i recently finished how's that okay um the first book i want to talk about is ariel takna's 
Unstable Stud, Ooh. which you spoke of not that long ago. Yeah, an episode or two ago. Loved it. It is book number eight in the Dream Spun Desire series. Um, I agree. I loved it to pieces. It's really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a horse person, and I know nothing about horses. Uh, so I found the um, stable setting uh, of this particular book uh, interesting and very, very charming. I loved both of the heroes. And I one of the things I wanted to mention is the two relative, not unpopular, that's not the word I want to use, the seldom, I guess, seldom used tropes in gay romance of uh, virgin hero and uh, May-December romance. Now, both of those tropes are present in this particular book, but they aren't um, necessarily uh, emphasized or an important mm, yeah. dri driving force in the story. Um, the two heroes are... Uh, an older guy and a younger guy, though we never learn their specific ages or the age spread between them. Yeah. Uh, but the characters, um, there's no problem. The age difference, whatever it actually is, is not an issue for anybody. Uh, also, the uh, younger hero is uh, incredibly, uh, well, he's a virgin, so of course he's inexperienced. Uh, and he's just waiting for the one guy, the right guy, uh, that he can spend the rest of his life with. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, the the whole, um, <laughs> what's what's the euphemism? Uh, uh, um, a, a romance euphemism. Giving his flower. <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> or, or something like that. <laughs> That's not a driving force of the story either. It's just too... Uh, two things that kind of show up in the story of a guy who is a horse trainer and the owner of the uh, farm where he works. Mm -hmm. So it's a really wonderful book. Thank you, Ariel, for writing it. It was really uh, terrific. I recommend it to everyone. Another one I uh, read recently is number nine in the Dreams, Fun, Desires series, Duke in Hiding by M.J. O'Shea. Uh, it's about a duke who is in hiding uh, in New England. He's a British duke, uh, and some family drama has forced him to go into hiding here in the States. Hmm. And uh, he spends some time getting to know the local barkeep. And they hate each other at first, but then they get to know each other, and they get all swoony, and they fall in love. And then they, you know, find out... Uh, you know, he's a duke, and there's all sorts of paparazzi in London, and all sorts of crazy stuff, so really, really good. Loved it to pieces. Um, I really like MJ's books that I've read so far in this uh, particular series, so uh, MJ also wrote the first book in the Dream Spun Desire series, uh, Millionaire Upstairs, uh, which I really, really enjoyed as yeah, well, I so I'm too. probably... Uh, going to uh, investigate some of MJ's other books. Cool. I think she's really great. Awesome. Yeah. I look forward to reading Duke and Hiding. I haven't read that one yet. Yeah. Um, so something that we found that our Tiva was gracious enough to drop into our list was some really awesome web series content from Unreal. Mm -hmm. Now, before, before we go into this, a little bit of a backstory. Last year, Lifetime aired a scripted drama about a reality television show. All on The Bachelor. Yeah. it's It takes place during the filming of this sort of Bachelor-esque reality show and all the uh, insane oh drama God. that goes on behind the scenes. And what I really enjoyed about Unreal is it takes um, a group of incredibly screwed up characters who are forced to make incredibly awful choices. Uh, <laughs> but what makes it so compelling and so interesting is that through the course of the show, we kind of learn about them and their motivations and their backstories so that we understand why they're making these terrible life choices. Yeah. Uh, during the filming of this despicably sleazy, lame 
reality show. It was really, really wonderful and really fantastic. I highly recommend that you check it out either on DVD or uh, streaming. It, it must be on some yeah, it's certainly somewhere. it's certainly streaming on Lifetime right now, gearing up for season two, which starts in June. In June, I think it's early June, yeah. based on the promos that we saw. I had such a love hate with this show. It's like I really loved it. It was well scripted. It was well written. It made me so tense <laughs> because of the choices these people were making or being forced into. Uh, <laughs> and I almost dropped it a couple times, but then I kept going with it. I was really glad that I did. Um, because in the midst of all the insanity, there were some really nice notes that, that wandered through it. And one of them was actually uh, the character of Faith, mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, and we're going to spoil this now because it's, it's important as we connect into where we're headed here. So if you haven't seen Unreal, there's a spoiler coming. Faith came onto the show as a very Christian, nice girl from Oklahoma, maybe, or Texas or somewhere. Yeah. Um, you find out as the as the show goes on that she's actually in the closet, has a maybe girlfriend, maybe not. You kind of don't know because both girls are in the closet but know they like each other a lot. Um, some really nice stuff happened in the series with it. But this thing that the, that the DVR, the TiVo, unveiled for us was this web series that was about Faith and what was happening with Faith after uh, the the reality show in the show ended. She got brought out to L.A. to do a jeans commercial uh, ended up living uh, in the guest house of this other lesbian couple with her girlfriend. A whole bunch of stuff goes on. It's really, really funny. Um, I hope I hope that means that Faith gets to do something in next season. I don't know how that would work exactly. Yeah. Um, but it was ten episodes. Uh, ten, ten, like two to three minute, like yeah. mini episodes. I mean, on the <clears throat> on the TiVo, each of these little things was like eight minutes long. <laughs> Yeah, because for some reason Lifetime aired them, I guess, in the middle of the night or something, yeah. and our DVR just found them. Went, oh, and really, you need to watch this. Yeah, so um, we really recommend it. We yeah. loved loved Faith on the show, and these little mini episodes sort of uh, show her continuing adventures. Yes, of the ni sweet, naive lesbian in <laughs> L.A. It's, they're really funny and, and super charming. The, and the best scene for me was when she went shopping with Dot Marie Jones, <laughs> who played Coach Beast on Glee, yes. and has done some other work since then. She is the is their friend who gives them shelter, and they have this scene in a sex, sex toy store that is just a riot. <laughs> Highly recommended. Yeah. So check out the Faith Diaries. It uh, is probably airing in bits and pieces on Lifetime. Yep. You can also check it out at mylifetime.com. Yeah, we'll, we'll give yeah. A, a link straight to it in the show notes yeah. for episode 30. So definitely check those out. Um, so now we're excited to unveil our new contributor spot, mm -hmm. which should also have a sounder and doesn't. <laughs> uh, you want to do one real quick? No, I got no? nothing. Okay. I'm sorry. So for this first week, we welcome Jay from Joyfully Jay. Uh, the uh, MM Romance review blog. Um, she talks to us a little bit about RT, because she went, lucky her, and gives us some book recommendations, too. So I'm here with Jay from Joyfully Jay. Thanks for joining us today and being part of our contributors. Great. I'm so excited to be here. So I know you were at RT recently. Tell mm -hmm. us a couple things that stood out for you there. Well, you know, RT, this is my third RT, and... Um, all of them are a little different. I think this one was really exciting because I participated in some really great panels and I feel like um, a lot, I came back with a lot of inspiration about the direction that gay romance is going and um, some of the things that are happening there right now. So it was really, um, really interesting and some really interesting sessions. Give us an example of a couple of them for those of us who, who weren't lucky enough to go. Sure, I know. It's a fun conference. It's an expensive conference, but it's a fun conference. Um, I think probably the thing that was my favorite out of the um, sessions was actually a panel that I moderated on crossing over between gay and straight romance. And there were um, five authors who write either um, series that have both gay and straight romance books in them or who write both genres um, for different, maybe for different publishers or in different series. And it was really interesting to hear about um, how they're sort of navigating that. Um, we had huge reader interest in this and author interest in this because a lot of authors are interested in branching out one way or the other. And um, 
they really, I was surprised to hear how little pushback the most of them were getting from publishers about um, adding maybe gay characters to a straight series or switching mid-series to um, a book that featured gay characters where they already had straight ones, um, or them just changing directions or adding direction in their um, current writing to add in new books and new series. So that was really exciting, I think. That's cool. Do you have any examples of books that folks might want to check out of series that do that? Well, I mean, one that I think that a lot of gay romance readers might be familiar with, um, Amy Jo Cousins, who was on the panel, um, for example, her Bender Break series, the first two books, three, either first two or three books in the series um, feature gay characters, and then the um, next book actually is a um, male-female romance with a bisexual female character. So um, that's one, and then the other books have, go back to gay characters. So that's one where it sort of splits in the middle. And I think it was really exciting to hear that um, their readers have been receptive and their reviewers, I mean, their publishers have been receptive because I think that really that's the direction where gay romance is going is not being so um, sort of solely focused by itself um, as a completely separate genre from the rest of the world of romance. And um, I sat in on an, actually another interesting panel on um, sort of changing directions in gay romance or sort of what's the next, what's the future of gay romance. And among other things that they talked about, um, was again this idea of gay romance not necessarily being a totally separate subset of romance, but just being incorporated in general romance, um, not necessarily its own subgenre, um, but you know, gay contemporary, gay historical, being mixed in with everything else. And certainly as a reader, my experience there was that um, there's much more openness towards gay romance, there's much more fluidity of people who read multiple genres and who are interested in that kind of um you know, of going back and forth and opening themselves up more. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed, because you said this was your third RT, that the, the the amount of gay romance is growing and, I guess, for lack of a better word, it's, it's acceptance at RT? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, like I said, this is my third one, and I will say that I've never really experienced any negativity towards gay romance or a lack of welcoming. Um, you know, when I went three years ago, I think that I could walk in as a blogger and say, I review gay romance, and not everybody read it or wrote it, but nobody was like, oh my gosh, get, you know, get back. But I think this year particularly, there was a huge contingent of um, gay romance authors there, much bigger than even um, in New Orleans, which was just a bigger conference in general because of the location. Um, so a huge number of gay romance authors that were there for the first time this year. And, um, you know, it was really exciting to see you know, people who maybe this was their first general romance conference coming and interacting with the readers and, you know, huge positive response. Dream Spinner actually is a um, very active sponsor and ran some programs and there were tons of readers there interacting with the author. So it was really exciting. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We got to go to one of those one year. Um, I know. I know. You out. know, like I said, RT is pricey and a little overwhelming. You know, it's thousands of people and hundreds of authors, yeah. but I mean, there's really nothing like that rush of walking in and just seeing thousands of romance readers who are, you know, itching for new books. And um, it's kind of a prize of palooza. I mean, they walk out <laughs> with stacks of books. And so it's a really fun event. So what are you reading these days that's exciting you? Um, well, right now I'm reading actually um, Hexbreaker by Jordan Hawk, which is coming out, um, I believe, on May 6th. And that, um, for those of you who might have read the Charmed and Dangerous yeah. anthology, she had a short story in there, um, The Thirteenth Hex, that was um, sort of a short prequel, and then this is the first book in her new um, Witch Police series. So I am an enormous Jordan Hawk fan and would read anything that she wrote. So I'm um, just in the middle of it and really loving it and would recommend her to anybody who hasn't read her. Um, I'm also excited. I was just looking at my calendar. I know Eli Easton's new um, How to Hallow the Moon book um, this one's How to Wish or Wish Upon a Star is coming out in the middle of May. And um, that's a really fun series because it's about this town of um, dog shifters, which is an unusual shifter premise in the paranormal world. Um, and the sort of unique convention there is that um, many of them started out as um, actual dogs and over the course of bonding with their human um got the ability to then shift between human and dog. So I think that's sort of a, whoops, sort of a cool and interesting um, shifter twist. And the other thing I'm really excited about, which isn't going to be out for a little bit, um, at RT I learned that Heidi Collinen is working on two um, 
uh, I guess, sequels to existing series, a new book in her Carry the Ocean series featuring Jeremy and Emmett, which I'm dying for, and even more dying for um, another book in her Love Lessons series um, featuring Baj Bajna Laja, which I'm super excited because they're going to Vegas to hang out with my favorite characters from her special delivery series. So um, that was a really big thrill because those are like my two favorite series and seeing them come together is going to make my worlds collide. So awesome. I'm really excited about that as well. All right. Some good stuff to look forward there. Yes, for sure. Well, well thank you so much for joining us and we'll be checking back in with you again in a few weeks. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Thank you to Jay for those uh, really interesting recommendations. Looking forward to checking out some of those those titles. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to encourage our listeners to leave their book recommendations for the other listeners in the comments for show notes in episode 30. Yeah. Since we've done away with the question of the week, this will be how we want to hear from our listeners. While we're getting this information from the contributors about what's exciting them, what's exciting you guys? Yeah. Leave us some comments. Um, and we'll, you know, maybe we may pick and choose a couple out to talk about in the next episode. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So interview time. Yes, you talked to the author of one of your most favorite recent books. Yes. Uh, Symptoms of Being Human, which I've gushed over in a couple of previous episodes, mm -hmm. uh, focuses on a genderqueer teen named Riley who tries to figure out who they are in the world and how where they fall each day on the spectrum of male versus female and how, that, how they interact in the world based on that. It's a brilliant book. So glad that Jeff took the time to come uh, talk about it a little bit. So let's get to that interview. So I'm excited to welcome Jeff Garvin to our podcast. Uh, Jeff is an author, actor, and musician. Uh, he started acting in high school, and his career included appearances on The Wonder Years, Roseanne, Kellen in the City. Uh, he's an award-winning classical guitarist and fronted the rock band 7K. Uh, he always wrote short stories and lyrics, and after that band dissolved, he found his passion in full-length fiction and his debut novel, Symptoms of Being Human was published in February in hardback, ebook, and audio. Welcome. So thank you for that awesome introduction. You know, being on camera while you're being introduced is kind of like you feel like a contestant on a game show. Like you have no idea what to do with your face during that. <laughs> if I could have had you walk out from the curtain. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> as the band played. <laughs> so tell me, what was the inspiration behind Symptoms of Being Human? Well, you know, I'm when you're remembering these things, it's always hard to pin down a detail. But the the thing that was the 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 fire that started um, was I was in a car with some friends and some acquaintances. We were all going to some dinner event, but I don't remember what it was. And the driver, who I'll call Jane uh, in order to protect her innocence, um, brought up a court case that was pending in my county in which a transgender student was suing the school district along with their parents for the right to use the locker room that aligned with their gender identity rather than their birth assigned gender. Um, it's crazy that just last week that North Carolina law was passed and all that uh, craziness has been going on. Three months prior to that conversation that I'm, that I'm speaking of, we had just struck down Prop 8 in California, which was the anti- uh, marriage equality bill, the anti-gay marriage bill. So when when Jane brought this up, I was like, oh, this is great. We're going to have this conversation about love and acceptance and equality. And then she said, ew, isn't that gross? Mm. And, and, you know, so I was like kind of struck dumb and I expected, you know, people to jump in and go, well, that's not fair and, and argue, but no one did. So, you know, I harnessed all my righteous rage and, and, you know, started a pretty gnarly argument. And, you know, the thing about arguments is they rarely change anyone's mind. Um, and so I left that conversation feeling like unheard and like violated, like how could someone think that way? Um, which is never a place you want to try to change someone's mind from. Um, so I tried to just kind of get over it and I, but I woke up the next day thinking about, that student and what it must have been like to go to school the day after that newspaper story broke, like everyone would be looking at you and they already know you're different. And now they know you're suing the school. And I just, I couldn't get out of that person's head. And so I started writing and what came out ended up being Riley's, um, opening blog post. The first thing you're going to want to know about me is am I a girl or am I a boy? And it spun from there. So based on that, it 
kind of a tangent question. Given that's where you started, did you plot this whole thing out or did you just kind of work your way through it from that blog post? No, I like, there. you know, they, they talk about writers being in two categories. You're a plotter or a pantser. And I feel like um, I get into a cave and I have a flashlight and I can see as far as the beam of that flashlight and really no further. Um, so I, I, the character um, kind of, characters sort of just show up for me and Riley just really showed up for me from that first blog post as like, angry and funny and terrified and socially awkward and I just you know I just dropped Riley into that family and that school and kind of watched what what happened um I didn't I didn't plot it out um the 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 idea of a congressman dad occurred a little bit later um to me because I was trying to create you know when you're writing a book about something you want to create pressures you know and I was looking for a way to to make more pressure. And I thought, you know, in my county where I grew up, Orange County is a very conservative county. Um, we've come a long way, but, you know, it's been a Republican-dominated county as long as I've uh, been alive. And uh, I thought that would really create some tension. Um, so, yeah, I didn't plot it out at all. Interesting. Okay. And how did you decide to go from the discussion that you had in the van over with a transgender teen to making Riley into gender fluid, which we hear even less about than we do trans teens. Yeah. So my memory of that experience was I was trying to write a transgender character and I thought, you know, the, the core issue is like what's between what the equipment that I have doesn't necessarily dictate my experience of myself, to put it really crudely. Um, and so I thought, what if, I, what, and I couldn't decide, I'm writing this, I couldn't, should I go where a, a, a person who was born uh, assigned male identifies as female? And I thought, you know, it would be even better if, the, if it was none of the reader's business. And then if it was none of my business, what this person's birth assigned gender was. Um, and that's where the idea of writing a gender fluid character had come up. Um, I, you know, I don't, I, I, at the time I had transgender people in my life, but I didn't know anyone firsthand who was gender fluid. It's something that I'd read about and watched YouTube videos about. And I really liked the idea of breaking open this conversation. You know, this was before I started writing this before Caitlyn Jenner came out. And so there really wasn't a lot of national media conversation. You know, the, the transgender movement has been going on for decades. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't a lot of national media conversation. And so I was trying to come at it from an angle of how do I open a conversation that just blows up gender identity as the convention that it is. You know, we had the Kinsey scale of sexual orientation in the 70s where you're not gay or straight. You're along this continuum and you're somewhere between. And I thought this would be a really great conversation and I'd be able to have this reader writer experience where we really got to say can we love someone a fictional someone can we relate to someone without knowing what their biological gender is because it's like the first thing you do when you look at someone is go boy or girl you know thin or fat tall or short mm -hmm. so that's that's how that idea evolved what kind of research did you do to to what at least seems to me to nail riley so correctly and how a gender fluid teen might feel going back and forth, because you get really in depth in in their head with the concept of the you know I feel more male today on the scale than female, or I'm kind of in the middle today, and yeah, how the various social interactions work with the parents and the friends and the enemies, for lack of a better word. Well, um, thank you. I so the research happened on many, many levels. Um, I will say that I think the most important element of writing a character that is, who has a different experience than you, your number one tool is imagination and empathy. Um, and so when I was writing the first draft, I relied heavily on that. I didn't try to get it right. I just wrote it. Um, I, I'm sure you've experienced this, the, the depth of white male privilege is so profound that you can't see what you can't see. Right. And so um, it was terrifying to me to try, to have to get it right the first time. So the first draft, I really just tried to bleh. Um, and then as I revised, um, you know, I, start, I really put on the lens of respect 
and um, you know, I, political correctness is such a bogus term. Uh, you know, I tried to I tried to form the language in a way that created the possibility that people really are. <laughs> so, um, so on the research side of things, so after imagination and empathy comes, um, I, I did read some. I tried to read some academic stuff. I read a couple of academic studies, mostly. The academic studies that are out there, unfortunately, are about crime and violence against transgender people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's disgustingly shocking the amount of uh, death and violence that are, that's perpetrated on non-binary people. 60% um, of non-binary and transgender people experience sexual violence in their lifetime. 60%. That's horrendous. And 12% before they graduate high school. So, you know, Riley is essentially a 1 in 10 non-binary kid what Riley goes through. Spoiler alert, and you're going to have to put spoiler on things. Um, so I did read some academic stuff, but it's really dry, and it doesn't give you anything about the experience. So the real gold for me was there is an amazing Tumblr um, community of non-binary people who are, like Riley does in the book, just sharing their experience, Part of part of partly just to wrap their brains around it, partly to reach out and find other people who are like them. Um, and there are some amazing um, YouTubers out there who are just um, really willing to explain it firsthand to you. If, and, and you don't need to, to have any terminology. You can just watch them talk about what it's like. So I relied very heavily on first-person accounts. Um, and it's amazing that you can do that kind of research from your, you know, from your house now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm super grateful to the, to the, non-binary community of bloggers and YouTubers for sharing that stuff because I really relied heavily on the experience of real people. And then when it comes down to it, you know, you have to, not every uh, gender fluid person has the same experience of gender fluid. So like, um, you know, Riley really swings on this pendulum between uh, masculine and feminine. And I chose that because I thought that was a, the most dramatic way to explain it. You know, not most gender non-binary people don't experience that dramatic swing. Most people are kind of like, yeah, I'm like right here most of the time. Sometimes, blah, blah, blah. Um, but to really have people understand it, I wanted to have a, a contrast. How much of a responsibility did you feel in this book? Because it's it's not one of those things that's often out there. You could find a lot of books on the gay experience, the lesbian experience, more books on the trans experience in fiction. But I think for many people, and I could be wrong here that this might be their first time to see gender fluid, especially in YA fiction. When I pitched the book, my my writing group was like, oh, that's awesome. Is gender fluid a real thing? Um, and without outing people, that, that was an experience I had over and over and over again. So I didn't start off feeling like this was going to be a responsibility thing. I just thought like this was, some, I had something to say about it. Um, and I've always believed that the the this was going to sound uh, voodoo-y, but I've always felt like the story picks the writer and not the other way around. And I tried not to write this. Like, I really felt like you've got the wrong guy. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of conversation about diversity in YA and diverse authors in YA, own voices, all that. So I really felt like this was, man, do I, do I want to be the person who writes this? But it wouldn't leave me alone. So at some point I had to give up and, and write it. And um, I felt a tremendous responsibility. I always feel a responsibility to write true characters that I would buy who they are and what they do. Um, but, you know, add this layer of Riley has a whole experience that I never had, a very specific kind of experience. Um, and as I got out there and people were telling me, yeah, I didn't know gender fluid was a thing, I felt like, okay, um, without being, you know, uh, a pedagogue, I have to find a way to instruct um, and, and, and explain this to people. Because I didn't have you know, in my original pitch, um, sometimes Riley feels like a boy and sometimes Riley feels like a girl. And so I didn't have that in the pitch as this gender fluid. So it, it was, it was a fine line because I, I wanted the queer community to vibe with it and relate to it and appreciate it. But I also wanted, you know, people in Northern Indiana to read it and go, wow, I had, you know, I didn't know this, what it was. It was a fine line to tell. And maybe in North Carolina too. Definitely in North okay. Carolina. Let's just send them a box of books or two. Yeah. I keep threatening to send the Westboro Baptist Church a case. Nice. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be a good candidate for it as well. I have There's an Amazon review, like one of the first five Amazon reviews the book got, and it's one star, and it says, I would not recommend this to anyone. 
paganism should not win out in the end. Paganism. Okay. Interesting. Apparently needed to leave it. Um, okay. That's just, I mean, that's the, it's an, it was a total instinctual thing. So what's the message that you want Riley to leave with the readers? I am so loath to tell readers what message to take away from a book. Um, because I feel like if I tell you my message, it locks out your message. Um, or the thing that you got from it. So I, there's definitely, I don't want to put a message out there, but I, I would say, I hope that readers fall in love with or come to know Riley without having to know Riley's birth assigned gender and that that is a satisfying experience despite that omission. And now that you've put the omission out there as a spoiler... I was impressed that you circumnavigated through that without even having the parents put it out there. Yeah. <laughs> when I started writing this, I thought there's no way that pronouns aren't going to paint me into a corner. There's just no way I'm going to get 50 pages done. And if I can get 50 pages, I'll be okay. And then I got 51 pages and I was like, God, now I have to write it. Damn it. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, uh, that was again, a lot of my critique group saying, oh, this really kind of gives away that, that Riley's a boy or this kind of gives away that Riley's a girl. So, because I would choose, you know, if Riley's having a, a more girl day, I would say, okay, frame this from a girl perspective, whatever that means. You know, that's the other thing about when you get into the gender non-binary, all of a sudden the, the ideas of masculine and feminine become 1950s again. And feminine means pink and masculine means blue. And, you know, these are just terms that we use. But um, it was it was that was a that was a, a a craft conversation of how do you create a scene where I don't see him or her he or she but you're not like going wait a minute why did you leave that word out or you know it has to be it has to feel natural it can't be a glaring you know deletion or a blank spot you know it can't feel like redacted right because I I was thinking about it as as I was getting ready for the interview and I don't even think you used a they or a there, which is what gender non-binaries tend to gravitate towards for pronouns. Right. Yeah, well, it's funny. I've actually gotten some criticism for not using um, non-binary pronouns from members of the queer community, and I, I totally get it. You know, finally, here's a book that represents my group, and you didn't attack the language, which is the biggest barrier. You know, without language, you can't have ideas. You, you can't have thoughts. You just have running images and you know we assume that everyone has our cultural experience of gender but like there are languages all over the world that are non-binary you know yeah. Tagalog for example the biggest dialect in the Philippines they don't have he she pronouns it's a non, non gender non-specific and so it, I think a lot of people are waiting for a book that really attacks the pronoun issue um, I didn't want to I tried that I tried a couple of pages with they or ze or and it just it, was, it felt so awkward to me, and I thought, if it's awkward to me, it's going to turn off a big part of the audience that might otherwise read this book and have their mind open. So and, that's a problem, because no one's attacking the language, and the language needs to be attacked. And kind of where I thought of it is that Riley doesn't know what that should be yet. Hmm. Yeah, Riley hasn't chosen. In their journey. He hasn't. You see, I just did that. They don't know what they want. They yeah. haven't made the choice, or they may not know they need to make the choice. I've had a couple of bloggers write me and say, can you tell me what Riley's pronouns are so that I can write a review? And I'm like, now you know how I felt trying to write the jacket copy. Because it's one thing to write from a first-person perspective, but when you start writing, this book is about Riley, yeah. you'll, you, you end up saying Riley like nine times a And cent. blurbs are always the worst anyway to write. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured out when I first mentioned this the book on the podcast, right after I read it, I was doing referring as he, she, which I just, that's wrong. And I corrected myself in the next episode to say that it should have been they, there. Yeah. Um, Cause I actually looked it up when I wrote the review for my blog to get it more correct. Yeah. Um, I've seen a couple YouTube reviews that I was so grateful for, but I didn't like repost them because they, they, they genderified the, the pronouns and it's yeah. hard. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a big barrier, you know, it's like, 
Because it's the first thing we learn as we start to learn grammar, pro yeah. how pronouns are yeah. supposed to work. Yeah, exactly. Have you gotten feedback from gender fluid teens that you know of? Have you seen? Yeah, yeah um, I've gotten some incredibly moving messages on Tumblr and via email. You know, everything from like one um, one person wrote me. My friend checked this book out from the library and gave it to me and was like, here, you should read this. And they were like, whatever. And then read it and was like, that was their coming out to themselves. They hadn't figured out where they were at and their friend kind of had figured it out. Um, so, you know, just this thank you for writing this because I didn't know who I was um, to, oh, my God, thank you for writing this so I can show my fr like wanted to come out to their friends. So they like highlighted some stuff in the book and said, hey, you should read this book. Um so, you know, that's, that's, that's incredibly moving and that's a wonderful reason to write a book is to help people <laughs> identify yeah. with their friends and with themselves. Yeah, that's really awesome, too, that the, the friend knew that that person needed to read that book. What a friend. Yeah. What a friend. And what a risk. Like, what, pardon my gender binary metaphor, but what balls it took to say, hey, read this book. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. Good friend out there. If you're watching this, what was your agent publisher reaction when you said, this is my first book and it's going to be a, a, a non-binary teen? They, I mean, you could see the dollar signs roll over in their eyes and they just dance thinking, oh my God, this is a huge, massive, uh, no, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny, this, while this is my debut, it's not the first novel I ever finished, um, I was out on sub with another novel that, that had attracted my agent, um, and it was part one of a series, um, and I was like, well, I'm not writing, I shouldn't write book two of a series without selling the first book, otherwise I'll have two books um, unsold, and so I was hunting around for ideas, and this popped up, so I started writing this, and my writing group was like, you should get this to your agent. I'm like, it's not done. I'm big on like, wait till, wait, let me finish it. And they're like, no, you should send this. So I called my agent and pitched it. And she said, oh, that sounds really interesting. Send me the pages and I'll read them tonight and call you tomorrow. And now my agent's awesome and she's very responsive. But at that point in my career, I was not a, I'll read this overnight and call you tomorrow client. I was a, you know, I'll try to get to your emails in 24 hours. You know, cause I hadn't sold a book. I was still new. And she called me the next day and said, I want to go out with this as a partial, which is, like pub speak for, I want to sell a, the book, but without it finished. Like mm -hmm. here's a hundred pages. But, so, um, I don't know if it was the subject matter, you know, part of selling a book is it has to be like other books that have already been sold, but it can't be like other books that have already been sold. It's a catch 22, right? Yeah. It's like this, but it's not like that. Um, and so I think the narrative voice was strong and, um, it was a conversation that was building, I think around the time I sold it, that was right as Caitlyn Jenner was coming out. So gender identity was a, was a national conversation. Um, and it, so I think I just got lucky in the timing of that conversation really being right. It would just be as a relevant book, um, at the time that I was shopping it. Whereas the book before was in a genre that had sort of been the publishing industry was burned out on. That's it's kind of interesting, you know, by the time a movie comes out, you're about 3 3 to 5 years behind the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. So, I think a lot of it was timing, um, but their reaction to the gender conversation was they were fascinated and intrigued. I'm really lucky Balzer and Bray is my imprint and they're an imprint of Harper Collins and it's owned uh, and run by two women um, Donna Balzer and Alessandra Bray, who are incredibly brave, loving, open-minded people. They've published a lot of books on the LGBTQ spectrum, um, including one that was a uh, Lambda Literary finalist for last year, which is, oh, I have it right here, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda by Becky Albertalli. Yep, yep. So th this Balzer and Bray, this is their logo. I'll just hold it up. Um, if you see a book like that, I haven't yet read a Balzer and Bray book that I wasn't like, wow, these People know what they're doing. So I think we, my agent knew the right place to send it to. Um, yeah. And we didn't do a, a big wide blast like we did with my prior novel. We did a targeted, we want to get this to this person. And it was a preempt, which means they, you know, they, they made an offer that was a, we want to buy this before other people look at it offer. So, yeah, I, I did not realize that uh, Simon and uh, 
Symptoms of Being Human were from the same publisher, but now that you've said that, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Because Simon was one of my favorite books of last year. It's, I'm, I'm like so pleased to be on the same, I keep saying, I keep, I think of record labels, so I'm like, I'm so proud to be on the same label, it's back to Albert Dolly, but the same imprint, it's imprint. Yeah, I, I think it'd be, it'd be really cool if, if, if Simon and Raleigh met up one day. <laughs> Some I, literary mashup. Well, you know, I just found out, and this is on Twitter, so I'm not spoiling it, that um, Adam Silvera, who wrote More Happy Than Not, another awesome book on the LGBTQ spectrum, although it's from Soho Teen, um, I think, oh no, I gave my copy away. Um, he and Becky Albertalli, who wrote Simon, are collaborating. They're going to write something together. That's awesome. So that's going to be awesome. So... This is your first book published, but you said it's not your first book that you've completed. What's the most surprising thing you learned in this book about your writing process? Writing this book? Yeah. What's, what's, well, just how little control I have over it. Um, you know, when you're learning to write, when you're in classes or when you're, you know, reading books about writing, it's all about the craft and, um, the, to me, the craft is such a, I, w I don't want to say it's a small part of the experience. It's just not the most psychologically challenging part of the experience. You know, if you're, if you're dropped off in the wilderness with a knife and a spoon, you're going to use the knife and the spoon to survive. And that's kind of how I feel about your tools as a writer. Like when you're dropped off in the desert of your blank pages, you're going to use the tools you have at your disposal. It's not like you're going to go, ah, oh, I should have used alliteration there, or, oh, man, a dramatic irony would have been great. It's like, ah, help me, I'm stuck. God. <laughs> so I think that the, it was disempowering to realize how little my brain and my talent or my tools have anything to do with successfully finishing a novel. It's really an act of, like, like it's like an act of will and a, you know a psychological endurance test can you continually try to be better because when you revive you know when you write a second draft it's like well if i if i could have done that better i would have done it the first time so you have to become a better writer than the dude who wrote the first draft i think that was the most surprising thing was like really i've already written a book like shouldn't i be better at this by now no 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 slowly but surely Slowly but surely. How does this compare to your other... You've been all over the artistic spectrum. From right. actor to film to writing to musician to lyricist. How does this kind of fit into your overall artistic world? And can you, can you actually say which one you like doing the best? Or are they all kind of fun in their own way and rewarding? You know, it's hard to say. I don't have the best track record about sticking with one thing for more than a decade. And this is, I'm only five years into my, I'm going to be a writer thing. Um, obviously this is the most commercial success I've had in my artistic pursuits. Um, but I would say we, the thing about acting that frustrated me was the lack of control. You know, you have to wait for somebody else to write a part and then cast you in it. And that was extremely frustrating. And the way to get around that is to, you know, do theater and write your own stuff. And that just seemed like so much work to get a role. And I was really frustrating. And, um, and then as a musician, um, man, talk about a market that's tough. And then you have to be in a band with other, you know, unless you want to be a solo artist, you want to you be, you know, be a band with other guys. So their opinion is ways the same as yours. And you have to, you have to collaborate. And again, there's this giving up of control. Um, and so I think, the reason why writing worked is because I really just got to be me in a room with a computer. I didn't need any gear. I didn't have to drive anywhere. I did. I did the math. When the, when the band ended, I I took my sleeping time, my drive time, my work time, and my social time with my wife, and I calculated that I had fourteen hours a week of creative time, fourteen to twenty two hours. I don't remember which one it was. And if I was going to be in a band, I calculated that like 40% of that would be driving and setting up equipment. And I was like, that's a waste. Yeah. Um, unless I want to just do it for fun, which is fine. Um, and, but writing, it was literally how long it took the computer to boot up. And then the rest was pure creative time. So I did NaNoWriMo in 2011 in April with a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, that first time you finish a manuscript, it's like, 
oh, I can do anything. So I just never got over that high. I'm still pursuing it. Awesome. So what authors do you draw inspiration from? Mm. Well, it's tough. You know, the thing that I love most about books is the narrative voice. I just want to get to know that narrator or that character. I think it's why books that change perspectives like first person, this chapter, first person, they are really hard for me because I, that's the thing I attach myself to. And if it's Chad chapter one and Jenny chapter two, I'm like, well, what happened to Chad? Um, so like the books that I, that are super inspiring to me are, um, you know, Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger would be the classic. Um, uh, Mark Haddon wrote a novel called uh, The Curious Case, uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Incredible. Flowers for Algernon. Um, those books are like the ones where I go, yes, that is, you know, uh, the beach by Alex Garland, but the authors that I will just like the authors that I'll read over and over and over again, my top two would be, um, uh, JK Rowling, the Harry Potter novels are, I, I re-listen to them audiobooks every year and Stephen King. I just, he's, that's it for me. I'll eat that up like soup. Nice. As a Stephen King fan, I have to ask, what's your favorite King book? Oh, uh, you know, I think eleven twenty two sixty three. Time travel, paranormal. He worked in the Dark Tower stuff. He got love. He got conspiracy. I mean, that's I don't know how you fit all that into a book and make me buy it, but he did it. Um, of course, I love the Stand. Um, but I mean, there's whole long passages of the Stand where I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Um, whereas eleven twenty two sixty three is a little more mature and cogent and I don't know. I love eleven twenty two sixty three. But I also love Hearts in Atlantis, um, and some of his novellas. Um I just finished Bazaar of Bad Dreams, uh the short story collection. It's awesome. And The Shining was the I read The Shining when I was like ten and it terrified me. And I stopped reading for like a year. So thanks, Stephen King. Yeah. For <laughs> Stephen The Shining was one of my first two, and I was like, Whoa! Okay. okay. Nest up. Let's put that away for a while. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Do you have any designs on revisiting Riley at some point? You know, it's so funny. I, people have asked me about a sequel, and I it, it until people started asking me, it never occurred to me. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I, I'm I'm not sure that there's another Riley main character book out there. As I thought about it, I thought, well, there's some great characters that we might you know we might revisit. Um, Park Hill, the next book starts in Park Hills. Park Hills is sort of my um, Castle Rock, Maine, I guess. Um, it's the proxy for my little North Orange County town, but um, uh, I'm not sure there'll be another Riley book. I, it's, I'm not compelled at this time to write another Riley book. Um, maybe I will be later. I don't know. Or even, like you said, if Riley just shows up in another Park Hill book. Oh, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. Riley shows up, you know, as the other seniors are graduating to give the commencement address or something. I don't know. Well, that'd be, I that would be like awesome so, if they became the, the valedictorian after everything. There'd be so much pressure attached to that, I feel like. I don't know. You know, I think, I think, um, I, I, I can't wait to see where gender fluid YA goes. You know, I, it would be arrogant for me to think I was the first person to, with an idea to write a book with a gender fluid protagonist. Um, but I hope that I hope that the success of Symptoms, and I hope it continues to have success, opens that door because there are amazing writers out there who are writing about their non-binary experience, and they need they ha you know when you sell a book you have to compare it to something else. So I hope that non-binary non writers are you know shamelessly using my title as a as a comp work. Um, mm -hmm. to submit their stuff. And I hope it all gets read and published um, because it's one thing for me to write a book about that experience, but it's another, it's, it'll be another entire revolution for um, somebody who grew up with that experience to write it. And I, I can't wait to see that happen. So what are the best ways for people to keep up with your latest? Um, well, I'm on, I'm a relentless social media hound. So Twitter is probably the thing that's the most current. Uh, Jeff Garvin books at Twitter um, but I'm on Facebook um, and Instagram, and you can go to jeffgarvinbooks.com and sign up for my email list. That's probably the best way to get like real information about like the events that I'm doing. Um, I try to do a giveaway a couple times a year of signed books. Um, so jeffgarvinbooks.com has the links to everything. 
So, Jeff, before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? Yes. Um, whenever I whenever I talk about symptoms, I try to share about the Trevor Project, um, trevorproject.org. They are the country's biggest LGBTQ helpline, suicide helpline. Just It's a place you can call. It's a, it's a website you can go to if you are a young person who's dealing with gender identity, with sexual orientation, harassment, suicide, any of those issues, that's the place you can go to get help. They are accredited. The people on the phone are amazing. Um, and I try to support them wherever I go. When I go to events, I have pens and stickers and stuff. So trevorproject.org. Um, and if you've got five bucks, send it to them. If you want to know how to help that community, that's the place to go. Trevor Excellent Project. suggestion. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing that and your book and for hanging out with us for a little while today. I had a blast. Thank you. So thanks again to Jeff for spending some time with us. And he actually spent more time with us than we actually had time for inside this show. So for the first time ever, we've got bonus, <laughs> bonus material. It's yeah. just like a DVD. <laughs> uh, if you go to the uh, show notes page for episode 30 at BigGayFictionPodcast.com, you'll see a secondary video there. That has about nine more minutes that we had with Jeff. Cool. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, quickly, before we go, we want to mention that Google Play Music recently added podcasts to its service, and our show, Big Gay Fiction Podcast, was among the first podcasts available on this new service. Yep. So if Google Play Music is your thing, you can subscribe and stream us there. Yeah. Very cool to be mm -hmm. on their service. Yeah. Yeah. So you could leave us a review there. Or at iTunes, or at Stitcher, or wherever else you happen to listen to us. Because right. we would love to hear your feedback through those channels. Most definitely. Yeah. So, I guess that'll do it for this episode. I think it will. Thanks. An In information-packed anniversary episode. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you back here next week. Bye, guys. Thank you for listening to Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. For detailed show notes, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com.